This is the Proton Guru video practice for topic 1.3. These problems will give you practice in intermolecular forces and boiling point and melting point trend identification. Some brief and straightforward reading to get you ready for these problems can be found in the Organic Chemistry 1 Primer 2018 in Lesson 1.3. You can also find additional chemistry videos and information on how to match the videos to your particular course's textbook at ProtonGuru.com. This first problem gives us a set of molecules and asks which molecules exhibit intramolecular hydrogen bonding. Now intramolecular means within the same molecule. So first we have to identify H-bond donors and H-bond acceptors within each molecular structure. Now an H-bond donor is something that has a very polar bond to a hydrogen. Usually this is an OH group, as we see in some of these structures, or an NH group. The acceptors, on the other hand, are electronegative atoms with a lone pair usually a nitrogen or an oxygen, so that that very polarized hydrogen attached to some electronegative atom will have an attraction for the lone pair on that acceptor molecule. So here I've highlighted hydrogens that might be part of the hydrogen bond donor in blue, as you can see in these structures, and I've highlighted the acceptors, these electronegative atoms that have lone pairs in red in this page. You should go back and see if you can identify these on your own to make sure you can get these types of problems right in your class. Once we've identified the H bond donor and acceptor pairs that are near each other, we have to point out those pairs. You'll need to have both a donor and an acceptor close enough to interact. So if we look at those molecules, we see that one, two, three, four of our molecules have both a donor and an acceptor that are in two separate entities that are close enough to interact with one another. Here we don't have any donors, so this molecule is not capable of intramolecular hydrogen bonding. And here we don't have an acceptor beside this donor, so this one's also not capable of intramolecular hydrogen bonding. Now the first molecule only has one donor and one nearby acceptor, so it's relatively easy to identify the intramolecular hydrogen bond that can form. If you look at what I've done with this molecule, I've kind of redrawn this unit from where it had originally had been drawn. It was originally drawn with the oxygen pointed this way, but we could just as easily rotate around this single bond and redraw our Lewis structure to put the O there and the CH3 unit here. I've gone ahead and reoriented this because you have to turn it so that the acceptor and donor are lined up to interact with one another. Now let's take a look at this one. We see that this unit has both a donor and an acceptor. This unit can also serve as a donor and an acceptor. So let's look at that a little more closely. We see there are actually three ways that you can have intramolecular hydrogen bonding in this case. If we use this O of this OH unit as the acceptor and the NH as the donor, we can arrange this to have this intramolecular hydrogen bond like this. We can also turn this unit around so that the double bond O is pointed up towards where it can reach the donor hydrogen. And then we could go the other way and use the OH hydrogen as the donor and this nitrogen as the acceptor. So there are three ways we can have intramolecular hydrogen bonding for that molecule. So let's get back to our list. We've done this one. We had three options for this one. We know this one can't do the intramolecular hydrogen bonding, nor can this one. So let's go and take a look at this one now. If we take a look at that one, it had one donor and one acceptor next to it. That's the only type of intramolecular hydrogen bonding we can have for that molecule. And finally, let's take a look at this last one. If we think about this, we have one donor unit, and then the unit beside it has these two oxygens that could both serve as acceptors for that hydrogen bond. So we can use the O from this OCH3 group to interact with this donor, or we can use the O of the double bond O to interact with this hydrogen. So there are two cases there. So if we recap how to address this type of problem, we first have to identify hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. Then we need to confirm that they are close enough to interact. And then we have to orient the units to allow donor acceptor close contact so that we can identify the hydrogen bonds as indicated by these dashed lines in our structures. Another particular application of intramolecular forces is being able to identify the solubility of molecules in different solvents. This question asks us which molecule have the best solubility in water. In order to address that kind of question, we have to think about what type of intermolecular forces are present in a sample of water. Well, water is a hydrogen bonding solvent because it has these very polar OH bonds that are necessary as hydrogen bond donors. So it would interact very strongly with molecules that are capable of hydrogen bonding. Well, in this case, all of these molecules can do hydrogen bonding, they have hydrogen bonding interactions because they all have these OH units and OH and NH units are the very common 
hydrogen bond donor units in organic chemistry. The question then is which has the greatest capacity to hydrogen bond per molecule? And that's simply assessed by looking at how many OH or hydrogen bond donor units you have. So this molecule has the greatest capacity for hydrogen bonding with three units, and that's how we figure out which is most soluble in water. So to recap our process for solving a problem like this, you have to determine what type of interactions are present in your solvent. If your solvent was something like this, where you had only van der Waals or London dispersion forces, it would be bad at dissolving a hydrogen bonding molecule. It would be good at dissolving other nonpolar molecules. So once you match the intermolecular forces to the most strongly interacting molecule, you'll know which is the most soluble. Here's one of these involved word problems, and it says that a chemist mixes sodium acetate, and they give you the structure here, in a mixture of water and ether. Let me give you the structure of ether here. Water and ether are not miscible with each other, and ether is less dense than water, and so they form two layers, like an oil and water mixture. And now the question is, which layer will most of the sodium acetate be dissolved in? Will it be in the ether, or will it be in the water? And the second part of the question is, will it be on the top or the bottom layer? So let's give ourselves a visual frame of reference here. We can draw a little picture of an apparatus you might use in the laboratory. We have two immiscible liquids, and the ether is less dense, so it should float on the water. Now what happens if you add the sodium acetate to this mixture? Well, we have to draw out the sodium acetate structure. We can go from the condensed formula to this representation of sodium acetate. And one thing we'll note when we draw it out like that is that there's a metal-nonmetal -metal bond. The sodium is a metal, and the oxygen is a nonmetal. So this is an ionic compound. We should know that from general chemistry. Ionic compounds, if they dissolve in a solvent, can dissociate. Now ions are best solubilized by a more polar solvent. So sodium acetate will mostly be in the water layer. And this happens to be the bottom layer. And that answers both of the two questions posed to us in this question. So when you have an involved word problem like this, it's best to try to visualize the situation. I even sketched a little picture to make it clearer for myself. And then you want to match the molecular interactions to determine the best solubility, like in our first problem in this video. And that allows us to figure out which of the two layers it will go into. Now a really, really common type of question that involves a knowledge of intermolecular forces comes when you're trying to rank boiling points. Or in a multiple choice test, maybe you're asked which has the highest boiling point. Here we're asked to rank these four molecules from the highest to the lowest boiling temperature. Well, the knowledge we need to solve this problem is that the boiling temperature is just a way to assess intermolecular forces. Stronger forces equal a higher boiling point. So to solve the problem, we have to figure out which is the strongest intermolecular force present in a sample of each of these molecules. If we figure that out, we see that some of them have hydrogen bonding interactions possible, and some only have van der Waals or London dispersion forces present, and this one only has dipole-dipole interactions. We need to rank these intermolecular force strengths, and if there's a tie, in case like both of them have hydrogen bonding, we have to say the one with more of these attractive forces will lead to a higher boiling point. So if we do that, we say, well, this one that has two hydrogen bonding units, the two OHs, will have the strongest intermolecular force between two molecules in that sample. That then has the highest boiling point. Next, this one only has one hydrogen bonding unit. Then we have a dipole-dipole interaction that's a little weaker than hydrogen bonding. That'll have the next highest boiling point, and the weakest intermolecular forces are the van der Waals or London dispersion forces, so that will have the lowest boiling point. So to recap our process for solving a problem like this, you have to determine what type of intermolecular forces are present, then you rank the molecules with the strength of their intermolecular forces, and if you identify a stronger intermolecular force, you know it has a higher boiling or melting point. Now here's the same type of problem, again, ranking these in terms of boiling point, highest boiling point number one, lowest boiling point would be number four. So we've got to figure out what intermolecular forces are present. So if we write down the type of intermolecular force is the strongest one present in each of these, we have H bonding in three of these cases because we have NH units that are good donors or acceptors for hydrogen bonding in all those cases. Now we have two H bond donors, two H's that could serve the role of hydrogen bonding in this case. Only one here, we have two here. So how do we resolve the tie between these that have two hydrogen bond donors each. Well, the next thing we have to do is look at what other possible attractive forces are present in these molecules. If we do that, we see that this molecule over here, in addition to having the hydrogen bond donors, also has this very polar carbon-oxygen bond. So in addition to being a hydrogen bonding molecule, it also has dipole-dipole interactions. 
So the sum of all those hydrogen bonding and dipole-dipole interactions will lead to stronger overall intermolecular forces in that sample than in another sample that has just the two hydrogen bond doning hydrogens. So our overall ranking would be that this would have the highest boiling point, next the one with two hydrogen bond donor units, next the one with only one hydrogen bond donor unit, and then finally we have one that doesn't have any hydrogen bonding, it only has dipole-dipole interactions.